sometimes people get the wrong impression that somehow God is raining on their parade or stopping them from doing something that they want to do. God doesn't do that. God lets you choose which way you will go every day. If you get up in the morning and you decide that you don't want to follow God, He lets you. You see, the choice is always yours. There's the opportunity to have a better way or to have your way. Admittedly, sometimes you'll go along and you'll think that your way is the better way. And the only way to experience that is to try it. And I always tell people that it sounds kind of weird, but if you're really obsessed with sin, then go out and sin. Because being obsessed with sin, you've already committed the sin. You see, it's already an accomplished fact in your mind. It's just a question of when you're going to get into it. And you will. Because once you've conceived in your mind sin to do something, once you've thought it through, you're going to do it. You'll follow through with that action because it will separate you from God. And until you get it out of your system and realize how horrible it is and the consequences of it, frankly, your eternity is what's being involved in your relationship. God isn't interested in your short-term satisfaction. He's interested in your long-term reaction to His love. And when you have that long-term planning in mind, then you'll agree with him about things that you probably shouldn't do because it really gets you involved in things that don't help you in the long run. Now, a lot of things, like the scripture says, all things are lawful to me, but not all things are expedient. Technically, according to law, since you're not under the law, you've been given grace that extends to being outside of the law, then you no longer find yourself under that condemnation, that feeling as though everything's you know, meant to be a bunch of rules and regulations that you can't live up to anyways, that you've got this guilty conscience that you're always saying, look, God's just so hard. I just, I don't know. I don't like it. You know, I want to go do what I want to do. Then do it. You know, when you get done with what you've done, then come back to God. Because there is a scripture that we recognize that says his mercy endures forever because God is merciful you see he does know that you have a sinful nature that you're going to sin you're going to backslide you're going to fall away at some point in time maybe some of you don't and praise the Lord God bless you if you don't you know I think that's wonderful and it's magnificent and it's something that should be desired far above all other things because there is a blessing to it that goes far beyond backsliding but I also know humanity, and I know most people that I've met backslide. And maybe sometimes in a small way, or maybe sometimes in a big way, because for every person, even a small way could be, you know, a big deal to them. Kind of like I heard a story one time about Chuck Smith saying that he couldn't go to a movie, and the first time that, you know, he actually walked into a movie, he felt like he was going to be going to hell because he walked into a theater. That's a small way of backsliding. <laughs> But for him, it was huge. <laughs> we know <laughs> that, you know, with every generation successively, there seems to be a hardening of the heart that we're not as tender-minded towards, you know, life and love and the grace that we've been given that we really probably should. I mean, frankly, maybe a couple hundred years ago, you know, when we had this so-called, you know, Christian nation that was founded by our fathers, you know, then, you know, wandering around in a bikini would have been sinful where today, wandering around bikini is taken for granted when you're at the beach. Now, I'll admit, you know, it might look a little funny in the dead of winter walking in the snow, but some people ski in the snow with bikinis on when it's sunny. <laughs> but you get the point, is that each generation has a conscience that must appear before God. They have a soul they must present before God. They have a life that they're going to say, what have you done with your life? You know, what is this that you have been given that you have now been given this gift by God to live that you give back to him at the end of your life to be given eternity for the rest of ages to ages to come and experiencing so many things that are going on beyond your imagination that you're just excited for the next age the next thing to come along not this stupid idea that they've got of this kind of like reincarnation thing you know no or evolutionary dissertation of going on no not even that you see God created the universe to exist 
up until a point. But he used the word eonio, meaning ages to ages, meaning it goes from one age to another age to another age. That's why it's called from ages to ages life, or as it says in Judaism, from everlasting to everlasting, meaning that you go from not stages, but from segments that go on throughout eternity. There's always something happening in these, for lack of a better word, ages. For lack of a better idea, these portions of God's dispensation, or these times where God shows something and reveals about himself. So right now we're in this one age, you know, it's kind of a physical one, you know, we're living in a physical body, you know, we're living and existing and breathing and doing what we think is like going to last a long time. But God says, no, what's going to happen is that you're going to live for this short period of time, then you're going to come back to the earth for a thousand years, and at the end of that I'm going to eliminate what you understand as being this universe. Once I do that, then there is more to come. There is ages to ages to ages after that. So at the end of the age, there is a termination of this you could say physical universe or this universe that we exist in and there will be something new because we know that the heavens and the earth will pass away with a fervent heat you know and that all things will dissolve but not we because we have a, a surety or a hope that is in god that we shall be you know when things disappear you know we'll be with new jerusalem and go with god and blah 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 so knowing that from one age to another age that's true we know because he says ages to ages we know that even more is true so there's so much more to get on with, then what we got with, and what you're dealing with today is just simply, why would you want to do it? Anything that would hinder you from going onward, because there's so much more happening up there, it's happening down here. But there's also that point where you recognize that, man, you know, you think you've blown it beyond what God said you could do. Well, it's mercy endures forever. You see, God really cares about you. He's not here to rain on your parade, to destroy you. He wasn't planning on wiping you out. He was planning on rescuing you from the very beginning. As a matter of fact, he would have taken care of all of your sins had we, in the form of Adam, admitted we were in sin. But rather, we didn't. You know, We kind of did those things that proved we didn't trust the love of God to take care of us. And that's kind of where grace is. You know, because Grace and mercy have kissed each other in a place that we find ourselves when we throw ourselves at the mercy of God because that's when grace and mercy kiss each other or literally become one in the spirit because God then forgives us because of the accomplished work of his son. But when you try to change that into doing something or adding something to it, then you really have taken away what God has done and you're trying to put something else in there. And God treats his son as the most important thing in the universe, so to speak, because of the sacrifice his son was willing to make the demonstration of the Father's love being revealed in that laying down his life for not just his friends, but for his enemies and for all those that even would just believe on his name. So you see, God's not about ruining your life. God's about giving you life and life more abundantly, not abundantly of money and not abundantly of wealth or material possessions because that's all passing away. That's worthless. There is nothing in this world that's going to pass with you into the universe. But you are going to move into eternity with the peace, the love, the joy, the meekness, the kindness, the gentleness, the temperance, the long-suffering, the mercy enduring forever. For everything that is of the nature of God goes back to God, and you go with it. But everything that's not goes into destruction and into a fire, literally, that will purge out that within with which we have not confessed as being sin that has separated us from God. So God really is all about wanting you to know that not only does he love you, but and not only does he has a wonderful plan for your life, you know, like supposedly in this life, he's got more in store than you ever thought of. I has not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. That means that way beyond what you think you understand right now is where God has planned something for you 
beyond your comprehension. And it's not sitting on some dumb cloud with a harp, you know, as one famous musician said to me, or said to all of us once. But rather, it's the universe. It's tripping out in a galaxy beyond our imagination and seeing the, all that God can create and has created and allowing us to be a part of His inheritance as both the Son and as co-heir with Jesus Christ. We get to walk with God and talk with Him as He with us. Is His mercy gone forever? His mercy endures forever. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy. Who is a God like unto thee that pardons iniquity? He retains not his anger forever, because he delights in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulations. And we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. A merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. You know, the greatest failure of Christianity today in America isn't so much about, you know, what's happening about the country and supposedly a Christian nation and now not a Christian nation and in you know aftermath. But really, the failure of America is to intercede, or the Christian is to intercede for America, like Jesus intercedes for those that are sinners. Do we intercede on behalf of the president? Do we stand with him to pray for him to come against the powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places that's coming against him, as well as all those who are in this land? Do we stand like Jesus does as a high priest for the people? Or are we rather taking as a high priest of the people and slaughtering them on the altar of our own incensed emotions and incentive to pretend and contend for righteousness that doesn't exist. So you see, we're trying to make America out of something it's not, rather than praying for something it could be. What we ought to be is like Jesus, who, having seen the nation, wept over them, that he would have drawn them all unto himself, but knowing that they would not recognize him, it was apportioned unto them to be disbelieving, and yet he would still, in the latter days, bring them unto himself and have mercy. Because you see, his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say his mercy endures forever. But what we say to America is, God shed his grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. America, America, we need to pray that we would ask God to shed his grace on thee. When we do that, when we ask for God's grace, not for replacing people or doing things or you know chastising them or beating them up or being some kind of like I don't even know you know they they tell me all kinds of things that are so not Christian I don't know how they became a Christian if they think that hating the Muslim is part of Christianity I don't understand that I've never understood that I don't understand how people can hate each other and say that they love their enemies. I don't understand how people can kill each other and love their enemies. I admit, I'm at a loss. That's not the God I serve. But when we pray together and ask God to shed His grace on me, to shed His mercy, His grace, that they would kiss themselves and find themselves at peace within our hearts, then we find ourselves able to minister to everyone and not to leave anyone to their own designs and falling outside of that covenant and that mercy that endures forever for the entire world has been given a precious gift that we are the ambassadors thereof to say to the world, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life and to not condemn the world but that through Jesus the world would be saved. So why are we saying anything else? And how could we do anything less than to tell the world what is the best?